Tie the Tasmanian Tiger. It was a platformer game for the GameCube, PS2, and Xbox, coming in hot at the tail end of the era of cool platformer mascots. After Sonic broke that speed barrier, it seemed like many others were following suit, attempting to capture a similar spirit with characters of their very own. This was a golden age for platformers, and while many of them have aged unfavorably, it was still an exciting time for kids who loved jumping around. A lot of people like to clown on these types of characters, but as a massive platforming fan that grew up in the early 2000s, thousands, I've always had a huge soft spot for a lot of them. My boy Blinks, for example, he's often remembered as Microsoft's failed attempt at capitalizing on the mascot craze, which is true, but I'd be lying if I said I didn't love his design, and the game itself I still quite like, despite its issues. But at the center of that chaotic mascot war was a little Tasmanian tiger named Ty, and this wasn't just any old mascot either. Uh, despite being from a smaller studio with a, a vastly smaller budget, they tried to take a bite out of the big guys. Like the arrogant Icarus flying too close to the sun, Ty slammed other popular mascots at the time, with this infamous commercial depicting Sonic Spyro and Crash as busted up hospital patients quivering in fear at the sight of the new kid in town. It comes off as silly and arrogant today, but back then it was rather exciting seeing another mascot take a stab at Crash after he spent years doing that to Mario. The war raged on, and when I was a kid it made me excited to see what this little tiger could do. This is one of the very first games I ever covered on this channel. Way back in the day when I had no idea what I was doing and I thought the road to YouTube success was paved by pessimism. Like Ty did to his fellow mascots back in the day, I made fun of the game and I made his problems seem way worse than they really were. All for the sake of, I don't know, comedy? Painfully mediocre, right, that's what I called it. I was trying to spin this bogus narrative of revisiting the game I grew up with as a kid just to find out it sucks. I just thought that was a cool and trendy idea, so that's what I went with. But by the end of that first year doing YouTube, I began to realize I was much more interested in exploring what positives and interesting ideas I could pull from games, even if the games themselves aren't all that amazing. I decided I didn't want to be just another YouTube funny man. I want to be somebody that just talks about the things I find interesting. I really don't think I was too fair with this little tiger back then, and now that I've been doing this a little bit longer, I really want to give this one a second look. And there's no better time than now. Fairly recently, the game had an HD remaster on Switch, giving the game a clean graphical uplift while making minor tweaks and adjustments to the gameplay. So let's do this. I'm going to re-review this game from absolute scratch, while also taking note of the handful of differences between this version and the original. I'm going to see how this little tiger's improved, and I guess you guys can see how I've improved. Chrome Studios. They're the bad boys behind this one. Being a medium-sized studio from Australia, they've dabbled in a lot of work for other companies, making some licensed games and even making two of the Legend of Spyro games. But before they were put on deck to craft an adventure for a little purple dragon, they were best known for a little slice of home, a boomerang slinging platformer about a Tasmanian tiger named Ty. Bonza! It's one of those things that plays into the country stereotypes while also being made by the people who are actually from there, so while it is all exaggerated, and cartoonified, it is a caricature of the people behind the game. Uh, just like how Trailer Park Boys is an exaggeration, but everyone I know here in Nova Scotia can relate to the show in one way or another. Damn, you know what? I don't think I ever gave this title screen enough credit. There's enough going on here to be visually interesting, but it also keeps it simple enough to avoid being cluttered. And I love the logo. It is ingenious. Like, the simple two-letter word makes for a large attention-grabbing logo that prefaces the rest of the title. Like most platformers from around its time, Ty begins with a pre-rendered cutscene. Ty and his friends are playing tag in the woods when he falls into a dark cave. He meets with an ancient spirit who explains to him that years ago, the Tasmanian Tigers fought with the evil boss boss Cass to protect the five talismans. Cass used the talismans to open a portal, sucking in all the tigers into a different dimension called the Dreaming. Amongst those Tasmanian tigers were Ty's parents, who scattered the talismans as a last-ditch effort to keep them out of Cass's hands. So it's now up to Ty to gather the talismans before Cass can, bring his family back to the outback, and put a stop to Cass's evil plans. Boss Cass is a really goofy and fun villain, I really like him. His design is as kooky as it is sinister. I love how over-the-top his voice acting is. And and they get some solid physical comedy out of the animation. How hard can it be? It's just a little orange rat. 
Tai presents us with that familiar clash of warm and cold-blooded creatures that we've seen before in Donkey Kong Country, but it doesn't fully commit to the idea by making the big bad a bird instead. The bad guys are all lizards, but the guy in charge is an ostrich. I think this is an interesting decision, as it helped to avoid obvious comparisons to K. Rule, a decently unique spin on a familiar concept. Tai works really well as an obvious foil to Cass, being more kind-spirited. He may be a result of the cool mascot era, but I find he's much more polite and less arrogant than similar characters like Sonic. He doesn't always have a quick and snarky comeback, and that results in some fun moments where a befuddled Tai doesn't really know how to react to something stupid somebody said. I'm allergic to gas. Otherwise, I'd do it, you know. Yeah, okay, no worries. You know what, that's something else I really didn't give this game enough credit for. The character interactions are really goofy and charming, and while the jokes don't always land, there's plenty of great moments. On your mic, you did it. It's just like, it's, it's, it's still good. It's still good, dude. It's still good. I love how the portal just boom, just throws him right out, he just eats dirt immediately. The gameplay is quite similar to other collectathons from before and during its time, most notably Banjo-Kazooie. You'll access a number of open-ended stages, each one riddled about with objectives that will reward you with a Thunder Egg, which is Ty's equivalent of Jiggies. In order to track down those talismans, Ty's scientist friend Julius has built a teleporter that can warp them right to us, but to power it, he needs Thunder Eggs, conveniently giving us an excuse to collect as many of an object as we possibly can. So, like with any collectathon, you'll complete various objectives to find them. You might find them by navigating obstacles, completing tasks for NPCs, or collecting every one of the 300 opals in a stage. Ty's got a variety of moves he can use to navigate his environment. He's got a standard jump and can glide in the air for a short time by sticking out his boomerangs. While it is a silly idea and does look kind of goofy, I do at least like it when games try to make this central object have as many uses as possible. Uh, for example, he'll also use them to extend his grip ever so slightly to hang on ledges. And of course, you can also actually throw them like you're supposed to do with boomerangs. Rings, uh, you can do this to knock out enemies. Uh, Ty wields two of them, so we can throw up to two at any given time, which I do really like a lot. I feel like if there's just one boomerang, it takes slightly too long before you get attack again, but having the two gives them a really nice flow. Some enemies you'll have to first break their defenses with a fierce bite, adding an extra layer to an effectively simple combat system. This bite can also be used as a sort of homing attack equivalent, stringing together a series of lunges to make your way across a path of spy eggs. It's pretty much identical to how you use the homing attack in Sonic to hop across enemies. Though it doesn't have that satisfying bounce that Sonic did, it feels a lot stiffer, like you've got less control over it, but it is used very sparingly, so it comes off as a brief, refreshing change of pace when it shows up, instead of being a central mechanic like in Sonic. You can also aim the boomerangs in first person for any of those situations where you want a more accurate shot, like uh, hitting a button on a wall or taking out a crocodile or something. The aiming in the original version I found really oversensitive, it was kind of hard to land on where you're trying to hit, but it feels a lot smoother in the HD version. I have a much easier time aiming here. Though the lack of gyro aim was a little bit disappointing, and it's weird because like the game does have gyro controls, but did they introduce gyro assist like many other Switch titles did? No, they made it so you can rotate the controller to zoom in and out with the zoomerang. They didn't like think to attach it to the only thing it's really good for, like no, they made it so you can tilt the controller left and right to steer Ty as he glides, like why? It's not really a big deal or anything, especially since Ty doesn't really have that much focus on the aiming, but I don't know, with how much smooth smoother titles like Turok or Stranger's Wrath play with the gyro aim in their respective Switch versions, it's a little bit weird to see a game like this use it in the most arbitrary of ways when other titles kinda already figured this out. But anyway, on top of having those two trusty boomerangs, Ty can unlock even more boomerang types. These range from flaming boomerangs that can melt ice and deal extra damage, to ice rangs that can freeze water creating platforms, or the zoomerang, a boomerang that can scope out enemies from a long distance. Some of these are definitely more useful than others, I like the ones that have practical gameplay purposes like lighting stuff on fire, or freezing stuff, and stuff like that, you know, instead of the ones that are just another way to damage an enemy. But even if the game doesn't make the most out of every rang, it is a fun little way to add a bit of variety, and I love the way that certain boomerangs will change the lighting on Ty. While some of these are mandatory, you can unlock some optional ones by collecting these big yellow cogs. You'll bring these to Julius, and he'll make you a new rang. My favorite one is definitely the Kaboomerang, if not just for that brilliant pun, and the way they collide to make the explosion after throwing both at once, it's so freaking cool. One nifty little thing they added into the HD version is the Rang Wheel from the second game. It's a much faster way of switching boomerangs and using a D-pad, so I'm glad they put that in here. Rainbow Cliff serves as the hub world. It's a little reservoir surrounded by rocky mountains with a tall and slender mountain in the center, with a bridge extending from the top. Now don't that sound familiar? Gee, I wonder where they got that from.
The inspiration here is pretty obvious, but unlike Spiral Mountain, I feel like Rainbow Cliff somewhat misses the point. While Spiral Mountain was an effective and iconic set piece that simply introduced the greater hub world that was Grunty's Lair, Ty makes its version of the set piece the hub itself, and I don't know, there just isn't really anything interesting here, it's just cliffs and water. Julius's lab is kinda cool, I guess, but that's all there really is here. I think it's fine visually, it works well as a little slice of Australia, but I don't know, I feel like it falls a little bit short of working well as an interesting hub area. But I guess it's the levels themselves that really make the difference in a platformer game, so let's see how they hold up. Ty's level design is pretty similar to other open-ended collectathons, being a sandbox full of objectives to meet, but unlike Mario or Banjo or other popular ones, Ty's levels often have a linear trail to sort of give you a tour before getting to an end point. Each level's gonna have one story goal, which you'll be explained and then guided to with a series of pathways and collectibles, which effectively familiarizes the player with their environment while having them stumble upon other thunder eggs along the way. Now, other platformers like Banjo usually have more scattered designs, where the player is incentivized to walk in whichever direction looks most interesting to them, and they do that so no direction is the wrong direction. It gives the player a lot of freedom, and I understand that Ty is trying to guide the player along an initial path to try and teach them the layout before giving them that freedom, but the problem is once those collectibles are all gone after the first run, you're then retreading the level again searching for those remaining thunder eggs, and the now itemless level is difficult to navigate. This is not a problem in a lot of the levels, but the larger levels, they can be a bit too large. Some of these areas have so much empty space that just doesn't have any good reason to be there, and paired with the maze-like, somewhat confusing nature of some of these levels, it can make searching for the remaining thunder eggs a little bit annoying once you no longer have a path to follow. Some levels are certainly better than others, so why don't we talk about one of those levels? I really, really love this nighttime one. It's structured really interestingly. Uh, the first half is linear, but then it opens up into a large lake area full of thunder eggs scattered everywhere. This level actually really nails that linear stage becoming open stage type of design because rather than retreading the same ground in a non-linear fashion, it offers an entirely new section to end the level with instead. It's also just a really chill level overall. I love the choice in color and the music, it's so good. It's the water and snow levels where I start to have issues with pacing, navigation, and level size. A swimming through all these corridors and past all these islands, it gets a little bit confusing when much of it looks the same. At least the map is really helpful. As long as I was cross-referencing with that thing, I didn't have that hard a time navigating the stages, but I think the fact that I have to rely on a map, that says a lot about the game's level design. I mean, Banjo and Mario didn't need maps because their levels were well-crafted and understandable, even if they were really big. Ty only gets that right about half half the time. But I guess even the weakest of levels still have their fun moments. I found it a little bit annoying searching the snowy mountain for the lost koalas, but damn dude, the lumber mill at the end, oh that was a really cool part. The water levels too, I mean the first one has this big mountain at the end that gives you a fantastic view of the whole stage, and the second water level, it has this really cute quest where you're searching for a treasure, each one giving you a little clue as to where to go next. Jeez, I remember complaining about this one specific jump in the original game, I had no problems landing it this time, and I I even went back to the original to make sure they didn't tweak it or nothing, and no, it's still the exact same. I have no idea why it's such a hard time with it. It's not a difficult jump. I think I just really made certain issues out to be way bigger than they were in that original video. I guess for comedic effect or whatever, I don't know. I do remember having all of these nagging little problems throughout each level, and yeah, they are still there, but they're so insignificant most of the time that I was hardly ever bothered by them. Like, yeah, there's a turret segment and it's dumb and annoying, but it's less than two minutes long and you do it one time in the whole game, so like, it doesn't really matter, there's no point in pretending it's a bigger deal than it really is, right? If it wasn't really easy and went on as long as it did in Haven, well then we'd have a problem on our hands, but this, it's nothing. Though I do still agree that the levels are definitely at their worst when you only have a handful of opals left and you gotta search a massive empty wasteland for them. I'd say this is probably Ty's biggest objective flaw, and it is a hurdle that I've seen a lot of collectathons run into, you know, when there's like only two collectibles left and you have to spend way too much time combing the entire level for them. Bigger isn't always better. There's a number of ways you could have fixed this though. Uh, firstly, you could simply just not require getting every single collectible in the level. That's what Mario games do, by having you collect 100 of the coins instead of every coin. It could have also been ironed out by smaller map design, with the pickups more carefully placed into areas that better grab the player's attention, instead of just throwing them in every single negligible corner of the map. 
There's a couple of different ways they could have gone about it, but if they really wanted the maps to remain this big, and they really wanted you to get all 300, if they were really dead set on keeping those two things, they could have still fixed it by adding a sort of opal detector, uh, similar to how the Spyro games do that with uh, sparks pointing you towards the last couple of gems. Let the infrarang detect how close you are to an opal. That would have worked. This game really needs that too, because god, I've spent up to a freaking hour in some of these levels looking for like the last two opals. It can get pretty freaking tedious. But I guess this is only really an issue for the players going for 100%. If you don't care about any of that stuff, there is a solid amount of wiggle room here. You only need so many thunder eggs to fight each boss and progress, so you're able to skip out on a handful of objectives that you don't really feel like completing. This is the same structure that Mario and Banjo both use, and I've always praised the hell out of it for giving players a lot of freedom to, to pick and choose what parts of the game they do and don't want to play, so that is one thing the game still does very well. As for those boss fights, they range in quality. The shark boss is pretty cool, going back and forth between the water and the platforms and trying to figure out how to deal some damage, and the fight with the giant yeti robot isn't too bad either. But other fights can be ridiculously easy. The first boss is so simple it's almost insulting, though it was a really fun idea to have you ride him like a horse in the outback level after you beat him. I really like how Mori will give each level a little rundown before you get to play it. Watching him struggle to make up reasons why this iconic Australian setting is such a big deal is pretty funny too. Lots of sand, red earth, and rock, and some more sand. And, and and another rock and, and more s <clears throat> yes it's glorious all right god i love this character there's something about watching a little pigeon with the mind of an australian boomer trying to explain game mechanics that just does not get old to me julius reckons it's got something to do with the space time conundrum but if you ask me, I think it's a load of bull dust. Much like the level quality, the writing is pretty hit and miss. Some of the jokes do land, and there are some great nonverbal exchanges between Ty and the other characters that are really fun to watch. But it's when the game tries to get dramatic or have any serious moments that it, it kind of just comes off as lame. Oh right, Sly. Oh, there's that iconic angst of the times. And remember, the only thing cooler than a cool character is an evil version of the cool character. A Sly is Ty's evil long lost brother and it is as cheesy as you could possibly make it. You've messed with Boss Cass. Now, I'm gonna mess with you. It's way too easy to make fun of, but I kind of really love it in like a campy kind of way, because it takes itself so seriously that it is hilariously adorable. Why is he hiding in the shadows? Like, you're, you're, you're like you're, you're gonna work for the guy. You don't have to, like, it, it's it's okay if he sees you. You don't have to hide from him. I love how they try to give him a character arc where he turns good at the end, but it all happens in such a short amount of time that it makes absolutely no sense for Sly to just decide to be good now. I also still feel similarly about the game's soundtrack, it is a very hit and miss. Any of the more laid back songs, often played in guitar and didgeridoos, they work really well. It's very easy on the ears and it gives any given level an extra bit of Australian zest to help set the scene. It's when the soundtrack dives into that techno pop sound, that's where it starts to fall short. The drums they use sound straight off of a Yamaha keyboard. The songs where it's used simply as a backing for the lead instruments I don't mind, but when it's the focus of the track, it just never lands for me. It kind of comes off as goofy and amateur. The game's theme itself, though, is quite brilliant. There is a reason it stayed with me even after never touching a tie game for years. It is a really catchy series of notes, and they very effectively work that into the jingles for collecting each item. <laughs> There's some solid attention to detail, too. The amount of Australian wildlife in any given level is always great to see. The developers definitely made sure to populate each area with tons of little critters. It really brings the environments to life. Another great detail is the sheer amount of idle animations Ty has. Watching him play around with his boomerangs in a bunch of different ways was kind of a treat. I've always been a really big fan of the choice in sound effects in this game. That, uh... <laughs> the boomerangs make is a very iconic sound, and the dazzling bings and bops for every opal you collect makes grabbing them all very satisfying. These little spider dudes right here have these bongo drum sounds for when they walk around, and it is amazing. The HD remaster brings these little details into a crispy HD resolution, with improved textures and a better frame rate. That one was the big sell for me, the frame rate. Uh, playing this game at 60 FPS, like with any game, really improves how good the controls feel. But even with the graphical uplift, don't expect the game to look comparable to anything new. It's still a PS2 game, and despite the coat of paint, it still looks like a PS2 game. The models and animations are still of medium budget 2001 quality. It's a remaster, not a remake after all, they didn't do it all from scratch 
but rather by retooling the existing game. So I guess don't go in expecting this sort of thing, go in expecting this sort of thing. But uh, yeah, for all the flaws this game still has, I did find myself having a really good time with it. Even 100%ing the game and plowing through all those more annoying objectives, I still got through it fairly comfortably. I guess I just really over-exaggerated how much these things bothered me back when I first talked about it. But you know, I guess I hadn't really seen anything yet back then. Now I'm a seasoned platforming vet. I've played many platformers with much greater issues than this. I mean, I've even beat Bubsy 3D for crying out loud. I know what a bad platformer looks like now, and Ty is not one of them. I still think it's funny how the 100% reward is a cliffhanger that teases you with a robotic version of Ty, completely and blatantly ripping off Metal Sonic, and then they do not follow up on that in the sequel at all. I mean, he is in the game, but as a minor character with no involvement in the plot whatsoever, so why the build up to nothing? I still don't know why they did this. But uh, yeah, going back to what I called this thing back in the day, what was it again? Painfully mediocre? God, what a needlessly pessimistic verdict. I mean, it is on the mediocre side of things for sure, but it's still a fun game, so I do think it is worth playing if you're huge into platformers. You know, sometimes I still get people tagging me on social media when this game comes up in conversation, often saying stuff like, uh, but didn't Nitro Rad say that game wasn't that good? And every time I see that, it completely breaks my heart. Knowing that there's people out there that did not give something a chance because of something I said? God, it stings. It like completely goes against everything I now value in this a bizarre, crazy, wonderful world of video games. You guys know I'm all about appreciating the little guys, the lesser polished experiences that can offer ideas, a, a charmingness, or an appeal that you don't always get from the big guys. In a world where people are so hesitant to play anything that does not have AAA degrees of quality, I want more than anything for people just to try things out. And that cannot happen when people don't give things a chance because of me. So I hope I've corrected that. A Tie the Tasmanian Tiger is not a fantastic game. Honestly, I still think it's rather middle of the road, but while I I do still have a number of problems with it, I would say the majority of the game is rather fun. I think I use the phrase uh, hit and miss throughout this video, so sure, there's my new verdict. This game is hit and miss. It is a flawed experience, but that doesn't mean it's not a fun experience. When Ty does things right, it can be a super fun game, and it does fumble over a lot of things, but it's easy to forgive because of how solid most of the game is. Ty is a rather special series, because despite being a B-grade game trying to capitalize on the AAA market, he was one of the few little guys that actually saw some serious sales. There's a reason a lot of people remember this character, because unlike Scalar or Dr. Muto or Whiplash or Voodoo Vince, a lot of people played this game. I mean, this version of the game was kicked started. I remember them meeting their goal very quickly, and it makes me really happy knowing that a mascot that most people write off as a forgotten piece of time that they only bring up to make fun of is still a character that some people can get excited about. Ty the Tasmanian Tiger is the B-grade platformer that could. Unlike many others, he actually got a pretty good slice of that pie. I think it's a good reminder that no matter how dominated certain genres can be, there will always be those little guys that'll come in to take a stab at it. I definitely recommend the game to anybody who's a big Banjo-Kazooie fan, as it's certainly a take on that kind of game. It's obviously not nearly as good as Banjo, but it will scratch your platforming itch in a similar manner. If you want to play the remaster, it is available on the Switch eShop, and will also be available on PlayStation and Xbox down the road. Uh, my only real gripe with it is that I think the asking price is a bit too high. 30 US? Man, I don't know, I, I think a 15 would have been a more appropriate price point, especially when the Steam version has been out for years and is way cheaper. But hey, with that said, they also ported the second two games to Steam as well a while back, so I expect them to do the same on Switch. If they ever get around to it, I'll definitely revisit the sequels as well. But for now, I'm content with just revisiting the first one. It was really cool giving this little tiger a second look. It was really interesting noticing like what sort of things I paid attention to this time, while before I was mostly prioritizing just picking out things that I could make fun of. The game hasn't really changed much, but what I was able to pull from it most certainly has. It is still a rather average game, but hey, average games can absolutely be worth worth playing. It just depends on what you're looking for. And all it took was a little Australian tiger to help me realize that. Thanks, Ty.